want to continue. Uh, we want to continue with my ex, ex equals Sergio now. Uh, was asked by um, Shmuel to announce it. But before, before, uh, before we start with this, I want to. Uh, uh, I was grateful for the opportunity to say a few things uh, about Sergio myself, and uh, these are characterized by these two, three C's. C's culture, commitment, and cut the crap. <laughs> I'll start, <laughs> I'll, start uh, I'll start with culture, and of course, I'll, I'll tell you like, you, you know, usually we tell about the first time we, we saw the person, we were introduced to him, and the first time I was introduced to Sergio was um, pretty much after I completed the first chapter of my PhD here at the Hebrew University. I gave a talk here at the Sunday seminar uh, this was about 30 years ago, and we, uh, it was the Sunday seminar started long before I was a PhD student. It was on Wednesday, except. Yeah. Ah, it Sunday. was on Wednesday. <laughs> the Sunday seminar was on Wednesday. You weren't here. You were in Tel Aviv. Yeah, and uh, so you <laughs> I was the one to move. But there were a lot of uh, the people here, like uh, Merale and, of course, Auman and uh, Leit Mashler and, and many others, that, uh, several others that are here. Uh, that attended these, these seminars. And after I finished my talk, I was very lucky. Uh, Bob Bauman liked my paper to the extent that he suggested this was a paper that related to um, a work by um, uh, Sergio and Mordechai Kurtz. And he suggested that, he, um, that he, he's teaching in Tel Aviv every now and then he attends these seminars that they have in Tel Aviv and I should come with him one day to present my paper there. And indeed, we, we set a time, and uh, um, uh, I was actually, f you know, a, a first or second year PhD student. is taken by great Bob Bauman to give a seminar in Tel Aviv. You can imagine how high I was at that time. Sergio was the chairman of the um, seminar in Tel Aviv. And you can imagine how miserable I was at the end of my seminar. <laughs> I was scheduled to get married a month later, and I started uh, th uh, rethinking it. It's, it seemed to be <laughs> quite irresponsible to get into a, a marriage life without thinking about uh, how do you can provide your kids. So I, <laughs> I was really bothered about it, and, but then I decided to, um, to keep going to this seminar. And, and so I, I added to my schedule uh, here at the, at the Wednesday seminar also the seminar uh, in Tel Aviv, and gradually, I, uh, I noticed that it, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay that Sergio knows your paper way better than you even without reading it. So it's not, <laughs> it's not a reason to get worried so much, and, um, and, uh, and I got married a month later. <laughs> So this is, um, okay, and when I, uh, when I uh, uh, returned to, uh, uh, as, a, as a faculty member, I noticed that uh, it's about culture. And here comes the culture. Um, I started noticing that, um, you know, guests that came here were pretty nervous before giving seminars here at, the <laughs> at our hall. They used to ask, uh, you know, when they came, um, tell me, is Sergio around? Is, is <laughs> Yeah, why are you asking? No, no, just, uh, <laughs> just wanted to know. I would often tease them and say, yeah, of course he's here. He said that he's looking forward to your talk. <laughs> um, and then they, uh, embarrassed enough, they, they decided to use the strategy and say, how beautiful is the seminar culture at the Hebrew University? How different it is from every other place? You know, they don't let you speak, and it's so active, and people shout, and people say, that's his culture, okay? <laughs> and but although it's a very important culture, I would say. Commitment. I learned uh, about commitment from uh, the book of Thomas Schelling, but I actually learned about how to use commitment from Sergio Hart. Now, I'm serious about it. Uh, since Sergio was the first... Um, uh, the first manager, the first director of the uh, Center for the Study of Rationality, 
And through the uh, development of the center, we faced lots of hurdles, lots of hurdles. And Sergio, uh, as uh, the director, and then uh, with his interaction with other directors, always used the commitment uh, strategy and explained me uh, by doing so that commitment is actually about nothing else but about revealing truthfully your preferences. It's not about tricking, it's not about manipulating, it's not about uh, cheating somebody and making somebody to, to be, it's just about being sincere uh, about how important things are for you and that if A doesn't happen, you will use B. If A happens, you will use C. Okay? And the message he, uh, he was giving to the university again and again is that this center worth keeping only if it is really one of the most excellent centers in the world. It just doesn't pay off to have anything less than that. And this wasn't a trick. This wasn't um, a manipulation. This was just revealing the truth. And when you do it, the two things could happen. Either the other party, which is the university authorities, uh, feel that it's important enough for them to keep it, and in which case they will cave in, or if they decide it's not important enough to keep in, and that you still use the best strategy you can do. Because you would have done the same even without revealing this information. So this is a very important, in fact, uh, uh, he, he was excellent in running the center. He was so helpful to me when, when I was the director of the center for several years. He helps now Ilan, and um, he's very instrumental in, uh, in having this. He, wa he was building this center. And he's, he's the, the, the main person who is responsible for its survival. OK? Now, the last issue is um, mathematical ingenuity. Sergio is a mathematical genius. I'm not uh, saying anything new to anybody here. But I was trying to figure out what is the source of his ingenuity. You know, there are typical types of, uh, different types of mathematical genius. I, I, I'm going to, to, um, to list four types. And I'm going to argue the set, that Sergio is one of them. There is first the non-intimidated type. This is the guy who, whatever mathematical problem you give it, will, will start working on it. Okay, well, I guess when Fermat uh, conjecture was, was solved, you had to have somebody who said, I'm going to go for it, right? And if you don't have that, you can be genius, but you, it's won't, it won't happen. Then there is the knowledgeable, the knowledgeable type. This is the guy that can pull out uh, at any moment a theorem from Rockefeller, page 215, <laughs> solve the problem, okay? He just knows a lot, okay? Then there is the off-track type, the off-track type, it's, it's quite risky to be. I guess John Nash was an off-track type. That thinks somebody that thinks, you know, everybody go and try to solve a problem using strategy A, and he comes and starts strategy B. This is, uh, this is a very specific type of ingenuity. Um, uh, you can become to some extent, you can become sick out of, out of being some, somebody like that. And then there is the fourth type, which I think is, is Sergio, is cut the crop type. What's the cut the crop type? Cut the crop type is somebody who can distinguish, when thinking about mathematical problem, between the important and the less important. This is the efficiency of the human mind the human brain. This is to be able to say, let's leave this aside now. We'll be able to tackle it later. Let's look at this. 
this is where, that's where the crack of the matter is. And uh, I think uh, Sergio is very much this kind of person. And it's not only the, that he is this kind of person in the way he thinks about mathematical problem, and I had all, all sorts of interaction with him in this respect, but he's also this kind of person in his life out, outside mathematics, very much in, his, uh, in, a, in the way he managed the center, the way he deals with people, the, the way he managed uh, the university, and we all benefited from, uh, from his, uh, the outcome of his ingenuity in, in, in research, but also from his, his uh, more daily type of using efficiency uh, way of thinking on, on more concrete and, and applied problem. And finally, I, w I have another very last issue, very short one, uh, which, which connects Bob Bauman to Sergio Hart. Uh, and this is about a story that I heard, for, or, or um, um, an idea that I heard from Bob very early in my career, uh, about uh, the four species. You remember that? I was, I, was, I was finishing my, my thesis and I got um, an offer for a postdoc with Werner Hildenbrandt. And I didn't know Werner. And um, when I got the letter, I went to Bob Aumann to tell me something about, about the person. And he told me the following. Uh, he told me, you know, in Judaism we have uh, four species. Four species, right? I mean, the, um, this is the species that we uh, bless on in Sukkot. And uh, each of them has a symbol. Hmm? Four species, we, we yeah, call yeah, it. Yeah, four species. species. Yeah. And he said uh, each one has a symbol. There is one which uh, tastes good and smells good. There is one that smells good but doesn't taste has no taste. There is one that has uh, taste, but it doesn't smell. And there is one, eventually, that doesn't have neither smell nor taste. And he was referring about life in academia. Uh, taste is, or let's, uh, le taste is like research. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one uh, property. And then everything that else is like smell. Think about it as uh, um, administration, teaching, and the other, other thing that we have to do as, as professors in our academic career. And he said there are people who have the taste but don't have the smell. There are people who have neither. But he said on uh, Werner Hildebrandt that he he actually has both the test and the smell. And another person, I think, has both the test and the smell, although probably a little bit more taste than smell, <laughs> is Sergio Art. Thank you, Sergio, for, for affecting my career. And uh, now I'm happy, I'm happy to introduce Grandpa Bob. <laughs> And Grandpa, but that's the way he refers uh, to himself, right? And uh, to, you, uh, to, uh, to you, to you, to, to you, you, yes. yes. And please, Grandpa, yeah. everyone wants to hear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yal. And um, uh, <laughs> referring to this uh, last story, uh, we, um, we, we tried to uh, suggest uh, for a professorship at the Hebrew University, uh, we, we uh, advanced the candidacy of God. Um, but uh, it, it went through uh, all the committees and finally it was rejected. And the reason is he has only one publication, and that's in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, he's no good at administration. <laughs> uh, okay. And everybody doubts that he wrote it. 
plagiarism also. <laughs> So we'll do a tasting menu for Sergio, like we did last week for Natalie. First of all, apologies. <laughs> and then hors d'oeuvre, an outstanding contribution to science. And then uh, we'll do some um, tasting, I guess, and um, stable sets, Shapley values of non-atomic games, existence of correlated equilibria, and weather and that. And we'll start with the apologies. First of all, to the speaker. <coughs> to the speakers today, uh, I have to apologize because uh, I didn't come to any of the talks, and the reason was that I was preparing this one. <laughs> uh, and to the speakers, uh, in the next few days, I apologize, I probably won't come either. Uh, and the reason is that I have, um, I, I don't, well, I, I, I don't understand mathematics anymore in, 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 uh, in talks. Uh, uh, but I'm saying I don't understand mathematics anymore uh, but that's really cheating because I never did understand mathematical <laughs> talks. Never in my life did I understand mathematical talks. And I used the time to think about my problems. Yes. <laughs> I used the time sitting there uh, uh, to think about my own problems. And that was, um, uh, that was a, a good use of time, but now I'm too busy to think about my problems, so I, 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 it's, it's useless to pretend anymore. I, um, I, I'm just not going to pretend, and, 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 and I have a good excuse because I gave up uh, not only going to mathematical talks, but also I gave up skiing about uh, uh, this, this, this past winter, the first winter that I did not go skiing in 45 years or something like that. So, my apologies to the speakers. And then uh, my apologies to Sergio, because it's, uh, uh, it's, this is supposed to be those elements of the, um, uh, yeah, I'm talking about my Sergio, of Sergio's works that with which I am familiar. So I never pretend to survey all of the talks of the people that I talk about, but only those with which I am familiar. But I am familiar with, uh, by no means familiar with all his work, by no means, yes, but even that part of his work with which I am familiar is much, much, much too long to uh, present here in, uh, how much is it? Uh, 20 minutes, okay? Uh, so, um, so I'm not going to even try. I, I picked, out a, a picked out a few segments here and there uh, which I am uh, going to talk about, but it's, it's really rather random. And uh, I'm not going to say what's more important and what's less important in Sergio's work, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it is so broad and wide, and I just picked out some elements of it. Some of them rather old. Uh, I think most of them at least uh, 20 years old, okay? So uh, we start with an hors d'oeuvre. Um, Remember the tasting menu? So we start with an hors d'oeuvre. One of Sergio's outstanding contributions to science. And that is the discovery of Hana Shemesh. So uh, that, uh, I'm quite serious, I'm quite serious, yes. Sergio, as, as uh, 
as Eyal mentioned, uh, he was the founding, uh, the, the first um, uh, director of the center, and the first thing he did was, um, well, I won't say one of the best, well, it was certainly one of the best things that he did, maybe the best, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, and that was finding Chana Shemesh, and no more needs to be said about that. Uh, <laughs> And let's get to uh, the taste. Uh, that's part of the smell, okay? <laughs> let's get to the taste. Uh, when I'm on Morgenstern's stable sets. I don't always quite succeed, but what I try in these talks about uh, um, my X, Y, Z is to, uh, is to keep all mathematical symbols out of it, yes? It doesn't mean it'll be necessarily understood, but I, it, 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 it at least goes towards that, okay? So I, 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 it, I try my best to keep all symbols out. I don't quite succeed, but we will, we will uh, almost out. So what, what's a von Neumann Morgenstern stable set of a coalitional game, like a market, okay? is a collection of outcomes with certain stability pro properties which we won't specify here. In large markets <coughs> with differentiated players, like employers and employees, so you have uh, uh, different kinds of players in there, okay? Or you, you could say, uh, uh, you could say that, the, that they hold different initial bundles, different initial goods. They have different things to offer. The, uh, the von Neumann Morgenstern stable set of the large market mimics the von Neumann Morgenstern stable set of the small market that with only one representative of each type. So for example, where, when there are only one employer and one employee, so the market consists of two players, the stable set provides that they can divide the surplus in any way they want. So there's some surplus in there, uh, the the uh, employer provides the uh, capital, the, the employee provides the labor. Together they make something that's worth more and they can divide that in some way they want, in any way they want, which is by, uh, normally it's the, the employer p pays the employee some wage and the employee and, and he takes some profit out by himself. So he has some wage and there's a profit. And the surplus can be divided in any way they want. Uh, the Van Neumann Morgenstern stable set says that that's provided. You can give the uh, a, a small wage to the employer, to the employee, and, a, and take a large profit. The employer takes a large profit, or the other way around, or anything in between. So when there are many employers and many employees. The surplus can again be divided arbitrarily, okay? But all employers must pay and all employees get the same wage, okay? So you can't have differences in the wages in the market. You will get an unstable situation when you have differences in, uh, in what... Uh, what one employ, what wage one employer gives, and what wage the other employer gives, they've all. You won't get a stable set unless they give the same, uh, the same wage. All of them. Yeah, you can have uh, uh, many hundreds. Yes. Thus, one may think of all the employers banding together into one effective bargaining unit. And all the employer, uh, all the employees banding together into one effective bargaining unit. It is very different from the competitive outcome. And the competitive outcome normally is unique, okay, in this kind of situation. Very often it's unique in that kind of situation. 
Von Neumann and especially Morgenstern considered the idea of competition wrongheaded. They thought that players will form coalitions. So they, they, this, the, the stable set does not speak explicitly about coalitions, but implicit in there is that the, all the employers form a coalition and all the employees form a coalition. And I think this was part of Sergio's thesis, right? So this is uh, 75, something like that, 76, huh? Something like that. <laughs> All right. It's a long time ago. Somehow 40 years ago, okay? All right. So we go to the second item, the Shapley values of non-atomic games. And, <coughs> and first I have to give some, some kind of introduction before I get to uh, Sergio's work in this subject. So the, uh, the, Sha the Shapley value of a player in a game is a measure of his usefulness or productiveness, his contribution to society. In a non-atomic game, there's a continuum of players, and the contribution of each individual player is small, very small, infinitesimal when compared to society as a whole. So uh, what we're doing over here is taking large economies or large games, okay, with many, many players and we model them as if they are uh, a continuum. We approximate the large number of players, millions of players, we approximate them by a continuum. So economies or voting games, here in a voting game you have uh, maybe millions of citizens, hundreds of millions of citizens, and they vote, and uh, this is approximated by a continuum. In games with finitely many players, the value is uniquely determined by a few reasonable axioms. Many of you know Shapley's axioms, so it doesn't matter. Just uh, take, take, we're not going to go into that now. now in non-atomic games, here is a V and an N and an infinity. Yes, I'm sorry about that, but, but we have to put them in, okay? To define values in non-atomic games, V, one partitions the continuum into a large number n of very small coalitions and then lets n tend to infinity. So what we're doing over here is, um, is uh, first we, m we modeled a large game with a large finite number of players by a continuum and then to get to the continuum, to find the value of the continuum, we approximate it again by a large finite number and we let it go to infinity. So there's a two-way approximation here. We use, the, to, we, we model it by a non-atomic continuum and then we, to define the value in that non-atomic case, we, uh, we approximate it by a large finite number. If the limit of the finite values exists and does not depend on the partitioning method, okay, then the limit is the asymptotic value. Okay, so uh, what we're doing, we're taking the non-atomic game, we're partitioning it in, into a very large number of small coalitions, okay? Each of these coalitions uh, is, is really a coalition of players, but then we look at that coalition as if it's one player. And then we t take the value of that. And then, so the, the relation to the finite value is very much like that of an integral to a sum. Okay, that's, that's general. That's not Hart. Now, here are some of Hart's contributions. The asymptotic value of a non-atomic market, if it exists, is the center of symmetry of the core. The core of a non-atomic market is 
the same as a set of competitive outcomes. Okay? And this implies, of course, that if the core is not symmetric, then the asymptotic value does not exist. Okay? Now let's uh, take an example. We have equal amounts of two complementary goods, like left and right gloves, and each player holds just one good. Okay? Uh, and it doesn't matter how much of that one good he holds. He, he, he's a small player, so he holds very little, but he holds just one good, either left gloves or right gloves. Then the core is an, inter in, in, an interval. So the price of left gloves in terms of right gloves can vary between zero and one. You could have the right gloves have a, a, a value of 1 and the left gloves have a value of 0, a price of 0, or the other way around, or anything in between. And the asymptotic value exists in this case, and it's the midpoint of that interval. And when the core has just one point, and that happens if the market is smooth, if it's defined by smooth utility functions, uh, smooth preferences, then the converse holds, then the asymptotic value does exist. And this, this, uh, these two theorems were proved in an uh, article in the uh, Journal of Mathematical Economics in 1977. When the core is not symmetric, then the asymptotic value does not exist. Okay? Uh, that follows from the first bullet. Uh, you have to have a center of symmetry. If the core is not symmetric, then there's no center of symmetry. But one can still use limits of finite games by introducing a population measure and requiring the atoms of the approximating partitions to have equal sizes by that measure. The resulting value is called, so you have a population measure mu, and we call the result a mu value. Let me explain uh, what uh, um, uh, what this is. Uh, what 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 uh, Sergio is doing over here? Uh, he's saying um, in in the usual in the definition of a game of a of a coalitional game, all that really matters is not the uh, identity of the player, but just how much, how, what resources he has, what tastes he has, okay? And <coughs> when you go to a non-atomic game, then no, there are no longer any individual players. So uh, the, the, the value, the, uh, this population measure, this is, says what proportion of the total number of players this has. So the individual player becomes important again. We say what is the number of players. The number of players in a non-atomic game really originally plays no role. You have to bring that back and then for every population measure every non-atomic market has a mu value if the population measure is mu and that mu value is in the core and this was published in uh, Mathematics of Operations Research in 1980. Now the next item is the existence of uh, correlated equilibria. A correlated equilibrium is defined uh, by a family of linear inequalities. Some of you may know what correlated equilibrium is, some of you may not know. It doesn't matter. Take it from me. It's defined by a, va a family of linear inequalities, all right? Now, every Nash equilibrium is also a correlated equilibrium, right? Correlated equilibrium is a generalization of Nash equilibrium. Uh, so it follows, since Nash equilibrium always exists, there it follows that there also exists a correlated equilibrium, always. 
But the proof of the existence of a Nash equilibrium is not, so to speak, elementary. It's not a linear proof. It's not a proof that goes by linear inequalities or linear equalities. It depends on fixed point methods. So it's essentially a topological proof. All right. Um, now, the problem of finding an elementary proof of the existence of a correlated equilibrium remained open for 15 years after the notion of correlated equilibrium was introduced in 1974 until Hart and Schmeidler cracked this problem. It's a, it's a problem that people thought about. It wasn't just, you know, uh, uh, it, it was a problem that suggested itself. You have a, a, uh, you have a um, notion that is defined by linear inequality. Not like the Nash equilibrium, it's not linear. It's, the problem is not linear. But here you have a linear problem, but the solution you have to go outside of the linear uh, framework of thought, and you have to look someplace else to get the solution to do it via Nash equilibrium. Now Hartmann Schmeidler did find an ingenious proof uh, based on the Minimax theorem for two-person zero-sum games, and that is a linear, uh, uh, th those are linear methods, the uh, Minimax theorem, and that is elementary. So, so that is an accomplishment. Uh, uh, this, this was published in uh, Mathematics Operations Research in 1989. And I'll end up, oops. Also good for many players. What's that? Also, when the Nash equilibrium does not exist. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Okay, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Oh, I forgot. Maybe I did know it, but I've forgotten it. This uh, yes. is my surgery. Yeah, that's, uh, that's your surgery. <laughs> okay. So now uh, I forgot to put in the entrances over here. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, I just finished uh, preparing these slides uh, five minutes to four, yes. Uh, if I had known that Yal is going to speak for 15 minutes, <laughs> I would have, I would have, uh, um, uh, I would have gone on, maybe given you some more results. But anyway. Well, now this is this weather and that. This is uh, something very nice. So with just one assertion, when you have, to, you have one sentence, you have a language consisting of one sentence, and the logical operator is not and and, okay, and uh, f from that it follows also or and implies and things like that. The usual logical operators of the... Uh, uh, the uh, propositional calculus. And you have operators that represent uh, two individuals, Anne and Bob. And you can, you can form a large number of sentences from that. You can say that Anne knows A, and you can say that Anne does not know A, okay? It is not the case that Anne knows A. And you can say that Bob knows A, and you can say that Bob uh, does not know A. And then you can say Anne does not know that Bob does not know A, okay? Uh, and uh, so on and so forth, okay? So you can really form a large number of different <laughs> sentences. In fact, a denumerable infinity. A state of the world is a maximal consistent list of such sentences, okay? So you take a, take a list of sentences, you make sure that they don't contradict each other, and then you say, well, can I add another sentence to that list? So it still won't contradict. And if you can't, yeah, okay. You add that sentence, and you go on, do, keep doing this, 
until you can't add any more without getting an inconsistency. So that's a maximal consistent list of such sentences. The question arises, so that's a state of the world, one list, okay? So it tells you exactly the knowledge or the lack thereof of Anne and Bob about this one item A, okay? Uh, um, I think in, uh, and I, not only do I think, I know that in the paper of um, Hart and uh, Heifetz and Summit uh, that uh, addresses this problem, uh, the one sentence was, the, ha the hatter is mad, yes? <laughs> the mad hatter in, uh, in Alice in Wonderland the hatter is mad. That was the one assertion, okay? But now the question is, Anne and Bob, do they know that the, ma that, the hatter is ma that the hatter is mad or not? And do they know about each other's knowledge or each other's lack of knowledge and so on and so forth? So, uh, so the question arises whether the number of different states is denumerable or, or whether there I could be a continuum. Now, I tried for eight months very hard to answer that simple question with no success. Because when one concatenates these things, um, I'm going to cut the crap over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you raise up this thing for a moment just, okay. You can look at these two. No, no, no. Uh, uh, put the slides back. You can't do it. Modern <laughs> technology. <laughs> oh, that's great. So put the slide back on the back. But put it, put it on there. On there. That's it. Oh, okay, great. It's <laughs> All right. So now, so you have the sentence uh, A, the assertion A. And then you have uh, uh, A, and then maybe you have uh, K and of A, and you have K Bob of A, and then you have maybe not K Bob, K and of A, and so on and so forth. So just by taking KA, uh, KB, or not KB, you, you, can, you, you can have a, uh, you can spell out uh, j j like zeros and ones, yeah? If you take the one to be KA and the zero to be not KA, okay, then you get a, a sequence of zeros and ones. The only problem with that is that it turns out that you can't take any old sequence like this because you'll get contradictions, okay? Uh, you may get contradictions. Some of, the, some of these sequences are not consistent. So what Hart, uh, Heifetz, and Summit did, solved, they solved the problem by using the operator not that uh, and knows A, knows that. No, this, this says, for example, that Bob does not know that and knows A. But rather they use the different uh, uh, operator which says, um, they call it J, so it would be J. Uh, um, it would be J A of A, J B of A, uh, not J B of J A of A, and then J A, uh, J A not J B, uh, J A of A, and so on. These you can take instead of wh when. J B of A means that um, uh, Bob 
knows whether A, which is the same as uh, K, um, K, K, B, A, or uh, no K B or K B of not A. Okay, that's what it means. Yes, uh, and here when you go to any sequence like that, all they are all consistent. That's what um, this uh, triad found, and. Uh, so since they're all consistent, you can get any sequence of zeros and ones that you want. And as it's known, there is a continuum of uh, such uh, sequences. All right. So we can put the uh, We can put the, the slide back. This was published, I think, also on MOR, right? In 96? No, Jet. what? Jet. Jet, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Well, I know whether it was published or not. But not no, it was published. <laughs> yeah. In 1996, it was published. Anyway, I forgot the name of the journal. So happy birthday, Sergio, and um, uh, thanks, everybody. I'll not ask questions. Huh? <laughs> Any questions? What? Uh, even these results, you know. What's that? You know, even these results. Even this result. <laughs>